Fuzzy, and thanks so much for coming this morning for this um, Mount Support event on New Talent on the Rise. Um, I'm Anna van der Putten, I'm the Interim New Talent Manager for BAFTA uh, Managed BAFTA Breakthrough. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say a huge thanks to Sheffield Docfest for being an amazing partner and festival to work with. Um, BAFTA has supported the festival for, for quite a few years now, and it's always a delight to partner with a festival that supports and celebrates in scripted filmmaker storytelling for creative collaboration in all of its inclusive forms, uh, particularly outside London as well, which is so important. You might know BAFTA primarily from our awards activity um, across film, games, and TV, but we're also an arts charity uh, supporting emerging talent right the way through to more established talents uh, and promoting the best work in film, games, and television through the lens of <laughs> inclusion and representation. Um, we try to do this work through our industry and new talent learning programs, initiatives, and partnerships, uh, just like the one for this session today. Um, so this panel, New Talent on the Rise, will explore and showcase the work of emerging talent uh, and share their creative journeys and challenges with you and each other. So a huge thanks to our speakers and to our wonderful host, Anna Hall. Um, first, uh, oh, finally. Uh, I'd just like to mention that we are currently open for applications for BAFTA Breakthrough, which is our flagship new talent development uh, initiative, which is open to all roles across film, games, and television, um, for those who are at that breakthrough moment professionally. Um, so please do check us out on our website to learn more about Breakthrough and our other initiatives at BAFTA, um, or I'll be around as well if you want to come up to me afterwards um, to find out a bit more about Breakthrough or about eligibility criteria. Um, so before I officially introduce our host for this session, um, we have a short clip, um, just a bit on BAFTA Breakthrough and the work that BAFTA does to support new talent. Thank you. Um, so I will proudly introduce uh, our host for this session, Anna Hall. Uh, so Anna has been making films for over 20 years. She's been nominated for four television BAFTAs and is the only woman ever to be nominated in two consecutive years for the BAFTA Craft Best Factual Director Award. Her most recent directing credits include The Grierson, um, Commended the Family Secret for Channel 4, A Day in the Life of Coronavirus Britain for Channel 4, which was filmed in a day and transmitted three days later, which is crazy. Uh, in 2021, she won the Women in Film and Television Best Producer Award. Um, and she's the creative director and executive producer of Candor Productions, which is a Leeds based female led indie um, which hopes to create a home for filmmakers in the North. So I'll hand it over to you, Anna. Thank you so much. Well, welcome. Um, and congratulations for getting up and coming to this session. You've got an amazing panel here. And uh, I guess already I'm feeling a bit anxious that we're not going to get through everything that I want to, to ask these amazing people. So I'm, I'm not going to introduce them, I'm going to get them to introduce yourself. So why don't you um, just start by telling us your name, where you come from, and um, this session really is about, you know, kind of career progression and what helped at what particular stages. So why don't you tell us what your very first job in either film or Director of This Is National Wave, which is world premiering, um, our world premiere yesterday, which we showed on Monday as well. Um, and I'm here from New York. Um, my first job, I mean, I kind of took a circuitous route to filmmaking. Um, I would say it kind of started with Beijing, honestly, and then that translated into, and also I was an art director, um, graphic design, and then that translated into radio work, and that's really where. I started working on this film. Actually, I did a radio piece about National Week, um, the band, which is featured in my film. And that, and once I realized that they were about to um, re-release their album, I realized that I kind of wanted to and needed to document that process. So that started in 2013, and here we are. Um, hi, everybody, and uh, co-panelists. <laughs> Um, uh, my name is Henri Pablo. I'm from Canada, Montreal. Um, uh, my parents are Haitian, so I'm part of the Haitian diaspora. Uh, we're not numerous in, in Canada, but we are strong and have lots to say. Um, I'm here at the festival uh, doing my European premiere with 
a deer jackie, a thing that I shot um, over the course of three years or two years. And uh, yeah, so the first job would be, I was an actor before to being a filmmaker. So, um, and um, I sort of like forgot that I wanted to be a director. I went to acting school to sort of learn how to direct actors and uh, got uh, in the mix of things and was an actor for about 15, 20 years. And after that, I realized that I had stories to tell because of the characters that were uh, offered to me uh, or that I got were very flimsy or, or, or mess or and I had nothing really to say. Um, so I decided to tell our story, basically dive into my uh, culture, my, my history, and um, to have a voice. Yeah. Um, my name is Latanya Shannon. I'm a director, producer, and journalist. Um, I'm here as part of the break, back to Breakthrough Talent Scheme. My first job was actually as a trainee journalist straight out of university. And that's what I did my degree in. Um, and I was lucky to win an award at the end of um, my degree, which got me a traineeship at ITV. It was like a regional newsroom. Um, and I was a journalist at BBC, ITV, and Channel 4 News for about 10 years before I left um, to go to film school because I found it really difficult to cross over from journalism to documentary unless I left the industry. So, yeah, my first job in TV was as a trainee TV news reporter. Uh, good morning, my name is Ashley Francis Roy. Um, I grew up in lovely Leeds, um, not too far away, and um, my first job in TV was after I studied music at university, and uh, I knew I wanted to go into TV, uh, but I had no idea how to do that or what that looked like. But uh, this organisation called Creative Access uh, came up, and Creative Access is a, a brilliant organisation which you should look into it, uh, creates internships in the media for people from underrepresented groups. And uh, they had a job going in uh, the arts department at the BBC, and it was a year long traineeship. And uh, I got that, and it was a yeah, brilliant way to tell you. I had a really good year's training. Good. So, what I'm going to ask each of the panel really is just to help us understand the kind of the trajectory of what they're trying to, you know, we're talking about the fact that there, not, there isn't one moment, is there, in a career, there's lots of moments, but what would you say if you had to, to just describe your kind of career path and your pattern and what for you, you felt was a really kind of big turning point. Um, for me, it was when I won the RTS Journalism Award and I thought, oh, actually, I, I do know what I'm doing. But it took me probably 10 years to get to that point. So, um, actually, why don't you start with just, you know, why don't you describe, you know, from that point, mm -hmm. what you were doing, yeah. and we'll talk about the hurdles later, but just help, help us to understand then, what was your moment when you thought, okay, I'm, I'm kind of going in the right direction? Yeah. Um, well, I kind of knew quite early on that I wanted to direct films, and uh, so that was a kind of goal I had, but I was, you know, really enjoying getting experience as a, as a producer and producer on, on different programmes. Um, I suppose that my kind of obvious break as a director was uh, winning Channel 4's first cut pitch, which is at Sheffield in uh, 2019. Uh, so yeah, that's time that's what happened. And um, that was uh, yeah, an amazing opportunity. I had to uh, pitch a short film that I'd made in front of an audience and uh, um, compete against a few other people. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the prize was my first cut commissioned documentary, which was yeah, an amazing opportunity to get as a director, because yeah, often getting your first break as a director can be quite tough. And just tell us a little bit about that film. Uh, that film was called The Really Standards, and uh, I love it, I'm super proud of it. It's about uh, three young children growing up on the Isle of Dogs in East London, and the Isle of Dogs is a, kind of a really mad, wonderful place, and they're crazy, characterful kids with stuff going on in their lives. And it's just quite a simple, warm, funny film about, about them and their lives, really. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably like my most obvious break into directing, but I always think that I had a, a kind of more important break before that, because I, I started in arts and music TV, and um, I loved doing that, but it's kind of, um, it's different to the kind of films I make now, which is more about documentaries about people and real life and social issues, and I think in the industry those 
two kind of uh, genres, I guess, can be kind of quite separated and it's quite hard to move from one to the other. Um, so I knew I wanted to make more of those films. And uh, so I think my, one of my big breaks really was my first job working as a producer on, on a documentary that wasn't like a musical arts film. And um, that came from me basically having a good relationship with uh, an exec and telling them what I wanted to do and, and then kind of an opportunity coming up and it being quite lucky in a way. Um, that was a, a BBC free series called Hometown um, and uh, I spent about a, a year making that as a producer. Um, but it just kind of happened that he needed a producer and I, I was kind of around and I told him what I wanted to do. But I think that really, really was quite key in uh, getting me into the world of documentaries which then led me to directing. Mm, okay. So for you, what, is, is it about trying to develop a relationship with an exec or a commission editor? Would you say that that has really helped you? Yeah, definitely. I think it's about being able to be like, uh, more clearly you can be with yourself about what you want to do, uh, then you can tell other people that and then they can kind of help you do that. So I kind of, at that point, was really clear I want to direct documentaries or I want to make documentaries about people and I was able to, to start telling people that and I had this relationship with this exec who, you know, who, you know, was willing to help and wanted to, to give me a chance when he was able to. So, yeah, I think being clear what you want to do and then sharing that with other people is, is a big part of it. Okay. And you got on the Breakthrough Talent scheme for Bethesda, right? Yeah. Because of your Dan Lola film, I guess, is that right? Yes. Yes. So, do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Because, you know, from winning, you won the first cut pitch three years ago, yeah. and to what, you know, in the last three years, your career has totally taken off, hasn't it? So, um, just tell us about Dan Lola and how that film happened. Yeah, well, we were still making my first cut when uh, Dan Lola film got commissioned. And um, it was so, I think ch we, Channel 4 were working with Yinka Bikini, who was the presenter, and uh, the idea about Amalola came up. Um, and I was kind of making my first film, but I had a bit of time to do some extra research, and we found this amazing archive of Yinka, and it uh, became quite clear that there was something really kind of powerful and uh, moving that could uh, yeah, sustain a film, and, and Channel 4 were really excited and commissioned it. And so it just the timing worked really well that by the time I finished uh, filming my first cut, we started filming this Damalola film. Uh, and then when we finished filming the Damalola film, uh, the pandemic started and uh, I was very lucky to be able to then be able to edit two films remotely. So it, was, it, it kind of all worked quite well for me in that sense. Uh, yeah, and then the Damalola film came out uh, after the release enders and um, yeah, I think it really resonated with people because it was a, a different look at quite a familiar story that centred uh, the people who were at the heart of that experience rather than kind of outsiders going in to tell that story. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's been it really nice to see. Lot. It did win some great awards, <laughs> yeah, it's been lovely um, to, to see that recognition and to, to know it's connected with people. Brilliant. Well, listen, we're going to look at a clip of Dan Lerner now. Very brave, didn't you? So you were a journalist. You were working in the newsroom. You were 
various years from mm -hmm. and then you made the decision that you were going to go and do something else. Yeah. So tell us why, what was going on for you? Because you know, lots of people want to work in newsrooms and be that kind of journalist. Yeah. So what, why did you decide that you wanted to try and so I've always um, really been interested in, in people's stories and although it was a brilliant privilege and opportunity to work in the newsroom, um, it's really fast to turn around and you don't have an opportunity to really delve into a subject in the same way that you do with a documentary. And for me, I was meeting really interesting people on a daily basis as you do as a news journalist and not really having the opportunity to explore um, some of those um, subjects and circumstances that were coming up. And that's I, I love documentaries, I used to watch documentaries all the time, and used to love, still love film. Um, and so I just made the decision that after like 10 years, it was time for me to actually pursue my dream of trying to um, make long form films. And so the, the first thing that I, I did before kind of quitting my job and going to film school was I started making short films on my own. I had access to cameras in the newsroom. And so I just, I just try and like, I'd, I'd read like news in briefs in the newspaper and like Google things online and see whatever was interesting. I'd literally turn up with like a Z1 camera at the time. I'm giving away my age, but yeah, a Z1 <laughs> camera. <laughs> and I'd go um, and just and just shoot stuff. Um, so one of the first short films uh, that I made actually was my submission film um, for film school, which was about um, the Bosnian genocide. And, oh, and yeah, I really, I tell so really cheery <laughs> subjects, I love them. Um, yeah, so uh, it was the first time that a group of survivors of the genocide came in one um, space to discuss what had happened and to kind of like process what had happened. And it was an open forum, and like one person turned up so my film turned into something that it wasn't meant to be, but it, well, it, yeah, it turned into something different. Um, so yeah, I just tried to like, in the absence of being able to like cross from news to documentary, which was really difficult, I tried to make it happen by like picking up a camera and shooting and stuff and going and like interviewing and I learned to edit myself, learned on Final Cut Pro, learned how to shoot. I mean, I look back at that stuff and it is a bit like wobbly pan, but it was it was really it was it was good for me to yeah to kind of really throw myself in there. Yeah. And once once I'd started doing that and kind of solidifying this desire that I had to kind of tell these stories in a more detailed way, that's when I um, applied for film school. And I'm coming from a background I didn't really even know about film schools. I just I was like, how can I get out of the newsroom and into this? Thing and I'd apply for like, um, I suppose you'd call them first cut schemes, like the fresh, the BBC fresh scheme that was on at the time. It's just impossible for me to like move across from news to documentary. And I just so happened to work with another journalist who was a close friend of mine at the time. He had a friend who was an alumni of the NFTS, and she was like, hey, like, when we went to the NFTS, you should like, you should check that out. Um, so I did, and I was lucky enough to get accepted. That's kind of how I really transitioned from news to documentary. And what point did you shut the job in? Um, so, at the, like, it was a bit of a risk, but I am a risk taker. So, um, at the time, um, I'm really giving away my age now, but at the time, the BBC were going through like a round of voluntary redundancies, and they didn't want to let me go because I was younger and cheaper than the old, older reporters who had been in the newsroom for a, a long time. So I, li I literally had to like have a chat with my editor and be like, this is where I want to put in for a uh, voluntary redundancy. Because if you're going to leave, you should leave where you want to <laughs> So um, I, that really helped me in kind of paying for my uh, tuition fees. But I, I kind of put in for my voluntary redundancy before I knew I got in place at the NFTS, which was the risk, because mm -hmm. it's a really selective course, but I felt like, I felt like whatever happened with that money, I was going to buy a camera, I was going to travel around the world, I was just going to make it happen, so I just made that decision in my head that this is what I wanted to do, 
And so regardless of whether a government can put on school or not, I would have made it happen in another way. So I think you just have to be really focused on what it is you want to do and try and make it happen. Yeah. So what was your big break then after that? Um, Just 
to think about how different these experiences can be, and how diff how they can be shaped by you know where you live, where you're from. Um, I think that the support system is very different in the states than it is here in Canada as well. Um, there's much less support, honestly, <laughs> and um, so I think for me, yeah, and as I just think about the different kind of breakthrough points because there are many, <laughs> and not limited to one or two. Um, I mean, what comes to mind is really the kind of, you know, kind of internal breakthrough points as well as the kind of institutional, external breakthrough points. And I think in terms of the external um, institutional support, yeah, the first main breakthrough point for me was the um, ITDS. Uh, diversity Development Fund, which is a pretty big funder um, in, in the United States. Um, they essentially, there was someone there who, who was running that fund and believed in the film, and that's kind of what it took. That was about six months, six to nine months into my process of making the film and just kind of putting together my kind of initial reel. Um, and that was what gave me the funding to be able to go to South Africa for the first time and to, um, to really believe like this was a project that had, had legs. Um, and in terms of the internal process, I mean, I, I was also working as a journalist. I mentioned my radio work. Um, I was also working on a TV show that um, kind of was a news magazine style show that uh, focused on music and I um, initially imagined that this would be a kind of 15 minute segment within that show. And um, yeah, it was a long process toward, you know, um, breaking out of that mindset of that kind of template um, of, you know, imagining a piece where it would be something where I would be, you know, have two camera interviews and be nodding along empathetically with the, um, the subjects to a film that is a feature length film that um, has their talking heads and um, yeah, it was a, a long process of, of giving myself permission, I guess, to, to do that, to do what I felt suited the subject matter best and to allow the, uh, the footage from the film to really flourish and take the, the forefront, so yeah. So interesting. I mean, it's so interesting because I think everybody has those moments of internal breakthrough, don't they? And that's yeah. so important, actually, for us to recognise that it's about, you know, how do you, in that mindset of how do you actually get over whatever that hurdle is in your head. Exactly. Um, so why, how did you make that decision? Did people help you to make that decision? Or I mean, I think that it was part of the process. Like, I, I mean, I initially started out shooting all of my interviews, you know, with a camera and as well as audio and then and just talking with my subject and especially my main subject, um, realizing that it was more about the, the voice and and also realizing that there was this, uh, the film is kind of centered on this amazing Super 8 footage that the band shot of themselves and their kind of scene in, in South Africa in the late 70s. So um, just realizing that that was really the soul along with the music, of course, of the film. And um, like I said, just giving that the wings to, to, to fly. Um, became clear that that was the, the, of the utmost. Okay, amazing. Well, let's watch a bit of that. So you were probably in the last night? Yes, last night. That it was great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'm so, ever so grateful. So. Yeah, great. <laughs>
Why don't you now? So you, you, you talked about the fact that you were an actor for 20 years and then you wanted to cross over yeah. into directing. Mm -hmm. And your film, Dear Jackie, has been shown here. Yes. And the premiere is tomorrow. Tomorrow and then uh, Monday. Monday. Yeah, okay. yeah. And you know the time. I know the time. <laughs> <laughs> the time later. Yeah. Ask it for it, right? <laughs> so um, that process then, you, you wanted to, to swap over, you learned a lot about what you did actor. Um, you have been directed. Mm -hmm. That's quite useful, isn't it? If you're a, if, I think that, that crossover between learning, you know, being a drama director and then being a documentary director, lots of lots of people do it the other way around, don't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so just talk about that crossover for you. What did you take from your experience of being directed as an actor into your films? Um, yeah, well, acting school or acting teachers have taught me to that listening is the most important thing. The most important thing in a room for an actor is the partner in front of you. And then you react to whatever is thrown at you, right? So taking that for documentary and fiction also, because I, I do both, um, has allowed me to just sit down and really, um, to really listen and to really let the situation evolve and to embrace everything that has to be improvised or imagined on the spot and listening to the environment a lot also. So I've, I've taken that, brought it into um, documentary, and I've also <laughs> reacted to everything that I hate as an actor. Um, and I hate a lot of things <laughs> for an actor. So everything that annoyed me, I really try to do the opposite. Um, I really want my sets to be, um, not interviews, but we're sitting down, sit down with brother and sister and we're talking. Uh, I want people to be, feel at ease, that the whole process goes in their way. Like I say, my, my real pay is the set itself, not the, the single award or whatever. You know, it's, it's really, that, that really stimulates me and, uh, and, and keeps me going, listening. And what would you say, if you had to say, you know, to help people here work out you kind of what 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 would you look back and say actually that's a really big breakthrough for me in terms of as a director, what would you say? I go back to you, internal breakthrough for sure. Uh, that's the my main motor. When I um, when I stop trying to please everybody and get into the industry. Uh, I did corporate videos, I did video clips and commercials and all that, just trying to fit in. I, I didn't have a voice. I was like a bit lost, I was unrooted. Um, and when I just turned back to really what I wanted to say, so going back in my personal stuff, family history, um, being part of a huge diaspora and its history and its culture, all of a sudden it just went boom. And all these projects came and they were truly rooted and really deeply rooted. And, and after that, um, working alone for me is terrible. Like, um, and we often are alone, we, we write and all that. So I try to get people together as soon as possible. So I, I did this uh, mentorship program. So all the, because we try to do Afrocentric work, I have to specify also, that's one of the things that helped us break through is banding together. And for that, since the institutions are very closed off, we had to either lobby a lot because everything is government funded, unlike your right in the, in the States or... Yeah, yeah. So we do have the right to go and say we want our money back. You know, we, we, we pay our taxes, we, we want our money back, we want uh, the governments to invest in black culture. Uh, but for that, we have to have a voice, so we, we band together and we also do mentorship programs so we're able to, um, not to step up, but to, uh, to accelerate, basically, to get, to, to level up, uh, so we're competitive. Um, so banding together, finding our voices, and just going at it has been really a breakthrough for me, and after that, work has been really um, happening, yeah. Brilliant, good. Um, let's watch a clip of Dear Jackie. Sunday at 3.15 is the premiere and Monday at 5.45, so that's when you can see me again. That's um, when you will come. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what did you learn? What was the process for you of, again, you know, it, it's all building, isn't it? What's the process that you have learned from that that you will take into your next film? Oh, God, it's, it's such a long process. 
since. It was during COVID also. Um, I learned, and I, I still don't know if I can not do it, but to be close to your subjects, uh, I was really close to them. And um, as some of you know, black trauma is this huge, heavy thing that we go through every day, but to be really in their lives, um, and they were so generous, they had so many things to say. And so I, I got close, and it sort of, it, it hurts, you know? It hurts to be like stuck in a room, in the room and being alone with all these thoughts. So what I have to learn is sort of like, not distance myself, but always look for the joy, always like look for the, the, the hope or else, or else I'll, I'll drown with, with the, the hardships because it's a hundred years in this doc anyways of, of stories and, and beautiful things also. So I always try to look for um, a prosperous future when I, in whatever I do, try to find that, that, that arrow going forward. Um, yeah, and, um, and, um, and collaborative work, I, I, just, I just love sets. I just love being well surrounded with the, either cinematography or assistant cinematographer or whatever, I find that their input is so, so valuable. I'm not the type of deciding everything by my own. I, I call myself a generalist, you know, but I need a neurosurgeon, I need a, 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 all these doctors around me, and so and they specialize in, in whatever they do, and they bring the project even further than I was expecting. So, um, yeah, stuff like that. Great. So listen, you've all listened to each other. What 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 are your thoughts as you sort of hear each other speak about you know those that kind of trajectory of that journey? Is it is it helpful to hear other people's? You know, I always find when I come to Doc Fest, it's so amazing, isn't it, to meet other people that are in exactly the same situation as you? Um, because there's lots of barriers, aren't there? There's lots of challenges, and I think you know what I've learned about filmmaking is so much of it is about resilience and. Um, holding on to actually the film that you want to make and how do you then do that? Um, and so what, what would you sort of say in terms of just like how do you how do you think you've overcome some of the barriers that you've you've faced? And what is it about how can you help people to understand about that resilience? Because you've all talked about, you know, we've all had those moments where things haven't worked out or we've had to make big decisions. Um, who would like to kick off? I just have one kind of thought that in the way is just listening to you guys and I, I mean there are at least three of us, I don't know about your background, but um, that have Afro-Caribbean you know, heritage and uh, you know, at least for me that was definitely you know, in some ways a hurdle to, to kind of considering myself an artist because coming from a, an immigrant family that where it, well, that's not the kind of thing that was valued, um, you know, what was valued was financial stability um, and kind of status. And, uh, you know, becoming a filmmaker was definitely not something that, or a documentary filmmaker was not something that would guarantee those things. And I wonder if that's something that, that you guys struggled with as well. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. I, I remember when I told my mom I wanted to become an actor, she said, you know you're gonna be poor, right? <laughs> and I went, well, yeah. And she said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> and 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 that was the only like I didn't have the, the Haitian pressure of being an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, and stuff like that. Um, but um, once I once we had that conversation about this is my heritage, your your past mom is my heritage, and this is what you're, you're giving me. This is the company you're giving me, you know? She understood, and, and, and I was able to, to go on and into poverty. No. <laughs> <laughs> for a while, for a while. Things are much better, don't worry. Yeah. What about you, Rosanna? What do you, in terms of, you know, that you talked about um, Oh, well, you talked about perseverance. You yeah. persevered, didn't you? My yeah. goodness. You yeah. bought your own camera. You learned how to well, work. I borrowed. You borrowed it. Yeah. You borrowed it. Yeah. You, know, you, you did. You really persevered. 
there's lots of people don't do that. Lots yeah. of people I see say, I want to be a filmmaker, but they haven't, you know, that kind of real dogged perseverance of like, I'm going to go and make my own short film. Mm. You know, making your own film about the Bosnian genocide to start with. <laughs> Was um, I just, you know what it is, I've got to give credit to my mum, she's just a really strong woman. I've had like a really good um, example of what perseverance is, because no, nothing in her life has been easy. And so, I think I was just raised to like, I don't know if you can relate to this, I was, I was just raised to like, um, pursue what I wanted, because I knew that it was never going to be handed to me on a plate for various um, intersectional reasons. Mm. And so I um, I think some of the biggest barriers um, that is just maintaining your own self-confidence because this industry can grind you down. Mm. Um, it's, it's competitive and um, there are lots of people who, like it's a freelance, insecure, kind of tenuous, industry and I think um, the barrier that I've had to overcome is believing in myself a little bit more and understanding that things will always work out so I don't have to give myself a nervous breakdown in the process because it will it will um, <coughs> it will be okay in the end <laughs> that's been the biggest barrier for me and uh, yeah it's like my own like, you, as you were talking about, like, your own breakthrough, I think, mm. once you kind of centre yourself and understand yourself a bit more, mm. um, it becomes easier. Okay. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to shout out the mum as well. Yes. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> My mum's actually here. Yeah. <laughs> Filmmaking is like really hard and there's lots of pressure and it can feel a bit scary and uh, navigating a career, any career is also challenging sometimes and hard and uh, can be hard especially if you're from another academic group and so there's lots of like challenges I think that we face and I think yeah just you learn or I think I've learned to um, just always like remember that uh, I think filmmaking especially but storytelling is about uh, perspective and uh, your perspective is unique and valuable and, and like needed and uh, like people keep telling this stuff being like grateful to like actually recognize that like where like the industry needs us and not only do we come with like a great unique perspective but uh, yeah that, that, that they need us and, and be a great business mm -hmm. and so yeah great filmmaker I'm a good filmmaker <laughs> yeah good so um, let's just quick I'm just conscious of time um, in, so we're going to talk about kind of schemes in the UK, I guess, but you know, we've mentioned a few things, but what would you say, have, um, actually for you guys too, you know, you know, in terms of schemes or, you know, bursaries or funding or training schemes, just to help people <coughs> think about actually what are the things that they could think about. So you two have both won the first cup this year, which is incredible. That, I don't know when that's on, so you might be able to tell us, I think it's on Monday afternoon, I think. Monday morning, and there's also Northern Docs pitch on Tuesday morning, which is a BBC um, a similar scheme for Northern filmmakers. So we have got lots of opportunities, but what would you say in terms of things that we found? So let's talk about uh, the BAFTA breakthrough to start with. That's an amazing opportunity for you guys. Yeah. 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 You want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, BAFTA breakthrough is uh, it's amazing. Uh, it feels kind of I'm a member of BAFTA, we can go and hang out in the fancy bar. But beyond that, there's, um, there's some really like amazing stuff that it can do for us. I think that one of the, the biggest things actually is um, it's kind of like the hype it brings. Like BAFTA is a really prestigious organisation, everyone loves it. and. Uh, 
like when they announced that we were on Matthew Breakthrough, it really created a, a buzz around us and, mm -hmm. and our films, and that is actually very valuable, I think, and, um, and important for if beginning new connections with people you might work in the future and, and just putting you out there. So I think that hype is quite is quite very much. Yeah, for me, on these um, <coughs> talents news, obviously back to being grateful. You also get to meet lots of people from lots of different parts of the industry. And I always find that peer kind of support and encouragement for me is the most... Um, you know, you asked about barriers. Like One of the biggest things for me has been finding my group of people in this industry who have become... They're not just like random telly acquaintances. They're like who have become real friends who I can call up and speak on a level about certain things. And that's definitely helped. But I think that's one of the things that um, talent schemes introduces you to is a, a group of people who you can um, build long-term um, relationships with in an honest way. Yeah. And we got to, they, they asked us to submit eight people in, in, in the industry, like, you know, anybody who we want to have coffee with and, uh, you know, after using their kind of connects to make that happen. Yeah. We've kind of yeah, submitted like a dream list of, of filmmakers and creators we'd like to meet. Yeah. 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 And I've been on other schemes as well that's been similar in terms of kind of um, pairing you with a mentor. Um, and so for me, like that that's the my advice for anyone who's going to try and apply for a scheme is like be really focused with who you want to um, be paired with and like think about um, why you want to have that person as somebody whose advice you want to take and like and also I don't know about you Ash but um, I don't think like mentorship should be one-sided because like as we're coming up lots of people like call us for advice and help and I always find it more joyful when the relationship is like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Reciprical. Reciprical. So yeah. That's the thing with networking, isn't it? It's like it's, it always feels like really it's just about forming connections with yeah. people, and you like you both interested in filmmaking, and someone might have more to offer you, but it should be kind of you just have a a vibe, a, a relationship more than anything. Yeah. Okay, and and like you said, what, what I'm in Canada, what actually I was just going to say I did take part in the Edinburgh pitch a couple of years ago, and um, that's through the Scottish Documentary Institute. And that was really helpful for, for my process. Um, I, mean, I think I was kind of starting my edit at that point and still finding my way toward the form of the film. And um, yeah, I had a very different trailer at the time. And um, yeah, I mean, had to defend the project in, in front of a panel of 10 people. And I think that that was extremely helpful. Um, I think that just. You know, some some of the panelists really got it right away. Some of them didn't. And but regardless, I think that it was helpful to to my process to just have to defend it and really explain my choices and think about them some more. So I, I would say that that was extremely helpful. And, and I would just say one more thing, which is that you know don't undervalue the the lessons you can get from those nervous breakdowns that you have in the process. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so you, you are a mentor, but you also, do you, do you have someone that mentors you, or? If what? Do you have someone that mentors you? Um, no, well I have one, I have a, a script supervisor and a director supervisor for Dear Jackie, which was great, and it was just good to go have beer and just talk, film, and no budgets, whatever, no limits, you know? After that, my producer uh, helped me come back on the right path. But um, yeah, that, that was for Dear Jack, that was really great. But um, no, no, there, there's like no one. The industry is a bit smallish, and um, the people that have success sort of stick together. That's why we decided to do it ourselves. But as you were saying, you know, like it works, or you were saying it works both ways. Mentorship, you, you can teach, and you can also learn from the people you're teaching to, you know? 
and that's what we try to have this sort of collaboration between between ourselves to help us uh, go go forward. Um, there has been some places where we could ditch. We've got a festival called the R I D M. Um, so it's a dog fest, and there is um, uh, an industry platform we can meet. And uh, Dear Jackie was born in speed dating, basically. I was going around pitching to different networks and producers, and it was getting better and better and better. And the last one, CBC said, hmm, interesting. <laughs> and um, its, it's, it's premiere was at that festival also. So I encourage people to go to these industry things. They're, they're stressful. <laughs> But it's a great place to make beautiful mistakes, I find, too, uh, because the industry all of a sudden becomes fun. You know, everybody's, you know, smiling, they're sort of out of their usual loop, and they're ready to listen, and they'll let you make mistakes. So uh, I made a couple of nice ones, and they gave me this film, so I encourage beautiful mistakes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to have some questions in a minute. Just, so what's been really interesting, it's so interesting, you know, I was expecting your breakthrough moments to be like big moments in your career, but actually so many of you talked about their internal moments. And I think that's such an interesting angle, you know, for all of us to think about, you know, just how we encourage each other in, in, in confidence and in, 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 in encouraging people to be better filmmakers. And, you know, it's so interesting to hear that that's, you know, for all of you and for me too, that that's, that was a huge hurdle is understanding that, like, you know, that we can do it. So, um, what's your like gem that we're gonna you're gonna impart to this audience <laughs> on your your one piece of advice to try and help people get to the next level, Marissa? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> no pressure at all. <laughs> Just to um, persevere, like not not give up, because something always. Like I remember when I was really struggling to find a job, and I was like, "Shit, I've got to move back home. I'm older than thirty. This is not good." And you just got to like carry on and like just keep keep going, keep going, keep going. So that's my bit of advice. Of, like nothing's ever as dire as it seems. Like there's always a breakthrough around that. The corner, so I'll just continue. Um, I think mine is, yeah, the advice I gave at the beginning is to try and understand what you want to, to do and also like just to try and understand uh, who you are as a filmmaker and what you want to say. And yeah, I think, yeah, I meet a lot of people who kind of sometimes I think are a bit lost and that it's maybe because they're, it's cause they're not quite clear on that. And it, it is hard, but I think you can get through it by, by actively kind of you know, this is what I want to do, this is the kind of films I want to make, this is what kind of films I don't want to make, you know, I want to be a funny director, I want to be a sad director, like, yeah, just like ask yourself all those questions and, and then it will help you get there. Amazing, thank you. Wasn't that interesting? Um, so, it's
it's uh, nearly 10 past 11 and we've got to a quarter past, so I'm sure there must be some questions. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, thank you very much, guys. I thought it was really insightful. I just want to say a couple of the things that, like, were big takeaways for me were, as you just mentioned, like, being very clear on what kind of filmmaker you want to be and what you want to do so you can communicate that. And then also on reading the thing you mentioned about taking some time to reflect on yourself and who you are and then making films that, like, speak to your soul. That was really insightful. But for me, this is my, like, first kind of film festival. And I kind of have that constant like nagging anxiety that you're not like doing it right or making the most of it. So for kind of like new filmmakers that are maybe at their first festival or first couple, what would be your advice on how to really make the most of the next four days that we've got? Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. That that vehicle the uh, life sort, like really have fun, be yourself, and it might not work this time, but at least you're yourself, you're authentic, and people will come to you and, um, and take, a, take that leap of faith in yourself, you know? And it sounds as if it's a bit um, esoteric and stuff like that, but it, it really comes down to that for me, just to have a good time and then the conversations. Yeah. I agree 100. I, yeah, I would say be authentic and generate your own light and that will attract people to you. And watch some films. That's yes. what I like, just <laughs> <laughs> The first time I came to Sheffield Doc Fest, I watched so many films and that was the best thing I could do because it inspires you. And like by watching other people's work and like it, it sparks ideas in your own head. Just go and watch loads of films. That's what I do. And then you have something to talk about with people. Because it gets, gets harder and harder to find time to watch films. Yeah. So to like, be here and have that space. And yeah, I remember my first festival too, and just like loving it, loving seeing films I love, loving yeah. seeing films I hate. Is, and, yeah. Great. Any more questions? Hello. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for today's panel. It's been a fantastic way to wake up on Saturday morning. Um, and also, thank you very much for trusting us with this space. Anna for hosting it. Um, my question is a bit selfish, I'll be completely honest. Um, as a commissioner and a producer, um, I'm always looking for kind of amazing, inclusive um, stories and creatives to work with. But I'm always quite self-conscious of how I can best support people like you, to be perfectly frank. So have you got any advice for me on the best way to give you a safe space to be able to produce fantastic work like you showed us today? That's a great question from a commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> when, can I just clarify? When you say like you, what do you, do you mean? People of colour? What do you mean? No, I'm, I'm just being as achieve and do and, and, and take that seriously and, and also care about my development so I think I think quite lucky in that sense but I think yeah I think a, a sense that um, yeah yeah just being interested in, in, in nurturing and understanding you know always being available to hear the problems when they when they when they come up and to put them through I don't know if that's helpful but I think um, yeah just I suppose there's a lot that can go wrong and it's, it's quite exposing sometimes to everything isn't it that's gonna um, yeah understand that and support you through it and not come kind of frame with us. I agree with Ashley, like the same is I've had some brilliant experiences with commissioners as well and in those situations it's always been with people who are collaborative and like a solution focused, not someone who's gonna like scream at you because the first cut isn't great. So because that just makes things worse. So I think as a commissioner or a producer like it's always about creating space to allow someone to fail, actually, so that they can like 
Because everybody, like, everybody's gonna, I mean, this what, everybody's gonna make a mistake <laughs> at some, some point. And I think an uh, uh, effective commissioner is somebody who understands that and doesn't react from their own insecurities or fears. Like, best, the best experience <coughs> I've had with commissioners are people who are just completely and utterly, like, secure in their own craft, and then they can, that kind of transfers down the, the line and just makes for a much better experience as a director. And I just want to say, just the fact that you're even asking that question is just um, completely incredible and kind of mind-blowing to me, so thank you. <laughs> because I think that coming from the States, it's, it's kind of a, a very different kind of relationship, um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, for you, my goal, I'm the head of my project, and I would tell you that what I would like in a producer or commissioner is somebody who allows you to work out what your project is about, because a lot of the time you have a subject and you kind of know what you're doing, but at the same time you are like, kind of working out that kind of focus, that kind of synopsis that is just two sentences so everybody will understand what you're saying. When I look at the time, I'm like, how can I break it way down into two sentences? So somebody who allows you to go through that process to maybe not be in that shirt, you know, you just need somebody to help you narrow it down. Okay, one last question. Has anyone got one last question? Yes, they do. Hello. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being in the hospital here and supporting me. Um, I've come to school because, again, we feel this is the time that we've been serving our backs. And I kind of lost hope in moving forward. Um, and I do feel that people have shared something that's given a little spark in me. why you're doing what you're doing. And that's really, really important because it, as a filmmaker, as you <coughs> said that very, very clearly, it's not easy. It's really not an easy process. And actually being able to just go back to it. So for me, when I've had my box, or I just go back to first principles, I'm like, what is the point of me making this film? Because often, I know, we've talked about, you talked about that, Marie, that you know, often the film will take so much out of you emotionally, and you know it's so um, it consumes it's all consuming and you have to decide why do you want to do that so for me it's always about this and that's what's been so interesting here is i've talked about actually what is the essential reason that we're doing what we're doing uh, because you have to hold on to that and that's what i would say to you is just really ask yourself why do you want to do it so and that sort of answers your question about what do i get out of the festival it's like why do i want to do this why am I doing it? And you know, to really sort of gather that kind of sense of, you know, because making films is an incredible privilege, isn't it? And uh, you know, we've all been so fortunate to make films and you know, be able to, you know, you know, I always think if I can just help one person think differently about a subject through watching a film, I've done my job. And um, that's so. There's a there's an Albert Einstein quote that I used to have, which was probably <coughs> like. Oh, I can't remember what it was like. It takes a... Oh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I actually can't remember. But it's about, you know, it takes... It is about knocking away that prejudice. And, you know, if you can get one person to think differently or just be inspired through what you've done, you've done the job. So, for me, that's <coughs> really important that you've got to hold on to that. Yeah. I think that's the, uh, the other classic thing as well is just being connected to other filmmakers and having people that you can reach out to when you're in a kind of other uh, Batania and I recently went on a, uh, a filmmakers retreat for black filmmakers and uh, it was a really amazing thing wasn't it and, and there was a lot of uh, really interesting conversations but a lot of people just needed to kind of like vent and like release some of the frustration which I think you were kind of sharing and because uh, it has been difficult especially in the past couple of years and uh, I 
having that kind of network for them, people was is really valuable. Um, so that when you when, when you need it, you can kind of turn to people. I think that's the problem. I I second that. What's your name? Cecilia. 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 Yeah. Just find a group of people who you trust. Because like there's several in this room that I can like Ash is one of them as well. But like he. I can, when I'm just feeling really shit, I can just pick up the phone and be really honest and vulnerable. Because th this industry can be all consuming, as Anna said, it, it kind of becomes part of your identity, which I feel is really difficult when your job becomes effectively like who you are or how you describe yourself. So that's another thing, find something else other than this job yeah. that, you're, <laughs> that makes you happy. My thing is my plants. I grow loads of plants, I've got beautiful plants all over my, my place at home. Um, I like going out in nature. So yeah, find a group of people you trust and get something other than this job to focus on. And I think it, that's a healthy way of getting back on the call. Sorry, sorry. Um, I was just about to say, when I did Dear Jackie, when we were in production, there was at one point, my my assistant would always drag me home, and um, at the end of the day, I, I was like really tired, and nothing was working in my mind. Like I was really depressed. <laughs> nothing was working. This film was going nowhere. And she just told me, she says, "Trust your process. You you met all these people in a certain way. This was your idea. You want to talk to them in a certain way, also. So just continue doing that and." just brought me back to, okay, yeah, what is my process? And when those storms hit, I just go back to how I wanna like, live my life, basically, you know? And it goes back to producers or commissioners, you know? Sometimes they have a tendency of putting you in a certain box, so my suggestion is like, sometimes your artists, I try to do things differently with my background and stuff, so my storytelling will be affected also. So I'd love to be in a place where that storytelling is not already decided. How I'm gonna develop this idea, how I'm gonna like stretch it out and, and go back to, I don't know, ancient stuff like reels and how they <laughs> told the story around the fire and all that, right? So my, my films will be different. So I need to start right on the root. So basically, yeah, trust your process, what you started before, I think that's your true self. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Fabulous. And I just said, oh, sorry, so <laughs> now, um, in terms of the generating that support system, I would say that it doesn't have to be just filmmakers, but I would say that artists, um, it's kind of up to the utmost that they're artists and that they understand the artistic process and that they understand the uncertainty. <laughs> and um, yeah, but I, that's, Support system is made of writers, you know, dancers, um, singers, songwriters. So, um, but they all there's a, a, a bond there that we all understand what we're all going through. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to say as well that I do think it's like good to have boundaries as well about what you like want to tolerate because mm -hmm. um, it is kind of like you tell you at the end of the day, isn't it? And I think, um, <laughs> like, I think. Um, like you have to be able to say that I'm not gonna, I'm not willing to, to feel like this at a certain point, or you know this isn't, you know, sustainable for me, or this, you know, I need to take a break, or I don't know. Like, I'm not saying give up, but like I think it's also important to prioritize your well-being. And it's, yeah, it's just films that we love them, but you know, it's not, it's not worth getting involved. That's like do that. <laughs>
sharing. Um, I'm Becky from the Talks and Sessions team at DocFest, and just to let you know, I think there's a wonderful question about how to navigate your first festival. Um, if you go to our website and just Google on the search bar roadmaps, we've just put up um, four different roadmaps with advice about how you might want to navigate the festival if it's your first time here. So there's one specifically for people who um, are emerging talent, and we can give you some recommendations for events you might want to go to. There's another one that's giving advice about just specifically looking for funding or co-productions. They get the other two. I think we've got one around immersive media. And another, another one, but just if you go into the search bar, search for roadmaps, um, and you, that might help you kind of navigate and not be too overwhelmed because we appreciate it's a big program. Um, and I'm just going to pass it over to Emma to remind you about how you can register your interest in BAFTA Breakthrough. Okay, yeah, okay. Let um, me just quick remind you so the deadline for applying for BAFTA Breakthrough is Tuesday to start your application. Um, you'll get a few days after that as well. Um, but just go to our website, search Breakthrough. Um, you can also recommend talent to apply. Um, if there's someone that you think is really at uh, their breakthrough moment as well, those recommendations, recommendations go a really long way. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you at more talks and sessions. Enjoy the festival.